Hello there everyone and welcome to uh, the last edition of the uh, Squeezebox Advent Calendar. This is the big door. Uh, well done for making it through all these uh, incredibly geeky uh, looks inside my instrument collection. Um, I thought there might be a few people out there like me uh, who like looking inside these things. And uh, we've even picked up a few non-Squeezebox players on the way who are just uh, interested in how everything works. So uh, it's always good to spread the word. Um, uh, there's not magic inside there, just bits of metal. Um, so without further ado, I'll show you the uh, squeeze box here. And I'll save the best for last. So uh, this is my beloved uh, brown Salterelle. Um, and uh, it's a model called the Connemara 2. Uh, I showed you a Connemara 2 in the key of C and F, uh, which is a much later built one. Um, uh, but the reason I have this box is purely, you know, the proper way things happen in life. It's purely by chance. I didn't seek this one out. I think I'd seen a few posh boxes like Castagnari's and uh, some of the other posh makes at uh, Cambridge Folk Festival. The first year I went to a folk festival and actually saw instrument stalls selling these things. Um, all I knew was the music shop in Cambridge that sold me my first poker work at that point. And... Uh, so I wasn't really aware of what else there was, but I just started looking. And um, this, uh, I was during the holiday while I was a student, this uh, um, instrument came up for sale uh, in the classified ads of Folk Roots magazine. And uh, it was, um, I think it was £850? It might have been 650 I can't remember. You know, it's the, I'm getting old. I, don't, I can't remember what when inflation happened. Uh, but anyway, um, the chap that was selling this was in uh, Whitney and I went and saw it and I bought it and it, it's been my first and been with me throughout my whole career really in terms of uh, posh boxes and um, it's seen a lot of uh, both action and repairs um, but it's still going strong which is great. Uh, it has a fantastic set of reeds in it that uh, when very early on when I got it, I got it tuned at Niels Nielsen's and he somehow gave it a sound that was incredible and it's kind of stood the reeds in good stead even though he no, he's no longer able to tune because um, he's no longer with us. But, um, uh, you know, I know what I want from this box because of how he tuned it to start with. Um, and so, yeah, when we look inside, we'll have a little look at what makes it special. I mean... Um, I don't really know what makes it special uh, it's because it's mine I think um, but uh, it's unusual to find Connemara 2's with this sort of wood, dark wood stained finish um, they're normally black um, or a, you occasionally get them in no it's a different model you get in a light cherry wood they're normally black um, but uh, th there's a batch of these came from I think the early 90s possibly late 80s but I think early 90s and um, yeah, it was uh, it was previously owned by a man called Howard Salt. That's also sadly no longer with us, but uh, he was a sort of well loved character on the folk community, and uh, uh, he was very kind to to part with this for me because it's it stood me in incredibly good stead. Um, I know that uh, Pete Grasby also has a brown this era Connemara too, and he thinks it's the most uh, amazing box. And I know that Brian Peters plays a three voice version of one of these uh, with three stops from exactly the same batch. So whatever Salter Isle were doing at that moment in time, I think a lot of people think they were very good boxes. Um, so we'll have a look inside, see if there's any, any clues to give away. I know exactly what it looks like inside. I'm always taking it to bits and and uh, repairing things on the go, but, uh, but I'll show you. And um, I think we'll find, what we normally find is that some of these things are difficult to just see how uh, I think we'll find what we often find uh, that uh, you can't necessarily see when an instrument's going to play well you just know by playing it and everything falls in the right place uh, but yeah we'll have a look inside and then I'll play a tune on it at the end and so here we are on the uh, 24th with uh, the my trusty Salterelle Brown DG two and a half row uh, that's pretty much been on every gig I've ever done um, and that in some ways shows uh, I don't know if you can see even the 
the coating on this grill, which is actually brass uh, and just plated, uh, the, the sort of chrome plating is fading at the edges there. Uh, we have massive marks where my fingers have scraped the <laughs> paint away from around the buttons of the main bits where I play. Um, uh, and it's had all sorts of things done to it. This is the fourth set of bellows it's had, um, I think. Uh, and yes, it's uh, they're a good consumable part bellows. I, I think a, a professional melodeon player should treat them like a guitarist does strings. Uh, maybe not change them that often. Uh, so we'll have a look inside it. So the first thing we'll uh, do is take this front grill off. It's got one, two, three, four, five screws to take off. Okay, so we're inside. Uh, someone has written on my soundboard, uh, 14. I think that's part of the manufacturing process. Um, and there we have the two quite compact rows of uh, pallets on a sturdy aluminium action. Uh, and that goes under here. I, I can take this uh, plate off um, uh, to service it. And I can also take the back off to leave just like a keyboard action dangling in midair. And that's got a felt pad at the back of it. So that when I press the button, it doesn't just hit wood. Um, so that's the action. Uh, nothing particularly special there but it is a nice quick action and then uh, we have six pins to hold it in place you might notice we've been doing a lot of honers recently Italian bellows pins are a bit more chunky and uh... okay we'll take this right hand side off Put that inside the bellows Okay, so we've got two reed blocks that correspond to the two rows of pallets. Uh, again, we've got a tie here that um, I've experimented with having it attached, keeping the two uh, sets of um, reed blocks together. But actually, I prefer the sound of it when it doesn't do that uh, because I don't know that they're nicely held in place, and you just get a different, a different tone really uh, from having the blocks tied or not and I prefer the untied sound so uh, one screwdriver we'll take a block out and have a look at it there we go so uh, we've got square holes here unlike the honers um, square holes give you more air per uh, chamber um, so you can play at higher volumes we actually have an emergency repair here where one of the reeds has gone and guess what it's been replaced by a honer reed i've got a honer reed on my salterel imagine that um but they're nice italian reeds for the main part and i can't see a clue there to say why it sounds as sweet as it does i try and mess with these reeds as little as possible because i absolutely adore the sound they make and they've been touched up multiple times uh, to get the tremolo kept sort of a consistent sound. It's tuned very dry, uh, but Niels Nielsen refused to tune it absolutely dry back in the day when I first got it tuned. Um, he said that, that there would be absolutely no point in tuning it absolutely dry. You might as well just have one read. <laughs> Thanks, Niels. Um, uh, but he wasn't wrong because you get a nice sort of shimmer just by that slightly off dry sound. You get a nice shimmer without it being a gaudy sound. So we'll move on to the other side. Oh, uh, before I move on to the other side, actually. You see that 14 stamped in various places on the reed blocks themselves 
and uh, on uh, the case. So it's just, I presume it's uh, to make sure that the instrument uh, was kept, all its component parts kept together when it was being built. So again, we've got six pins on this side. And we'll give you a quick look at the bellows actually. Um, so you can see on this back side actually where I last glued on the bellows is a little bit, my gluing wasn't very neat. Um, so to replace bellows, what you have to do is cut the old bellows away from the frames, the wooden frames, and the bellows come with just, you know, just flush ends. Um, and then you have to glue them and clamp them down very tightly uh, to make sure there's no air holes in between. And I tend to use a lot of glue to do that job so that it uh, seals all the way on the inside here. Just, uh, I just use PVA glue. Um, so these bellows were made by uh, Igor Solnich for me in Slovenia. It'll be fun trying to order the next ones. Um, uh, we have lost one bellows corner already. Uh, it really always tends to happen in this place. I, it's something to do with the way I play the instrument. Um, but these bellows corners start popping off around the one year mark of, of normal gigging. Uh, you can try and put bellows corners back on, but you're kind of fighting a losing battle, really. Uh, if I was worried about that leak too much, I could just uh, put some PVA glue, which is slightly flexible, um, and just uh, cover the corner. I mean, the, the, these metal co uh, corners are just for protection, really. But what you don't want is a hole, which I do have here at the moment. Okay, so on to the left hand, um, I've got two rows of uh, chords and bass reeds. So uh, this block is for all the basses and this block is for all the chords. We'll take the chord one off first and you can see how the third stop works when we do that. So we have a slider here attached to the stop which goes up and down and is just held in place by friction of the block that's had this little recess where the, where the stop um, and the slider go. So in an instrument that's designed to have its thirds taken out all the thirds are on this set of reeds here and then on this side you double up the number of replates for the first and the fifth and by blanking this one off you can have thirds in or thirds out chords. Uh, these reeds are actually pretty filthy and in fact that's from uh, the dim and distant past because that's on this side where the air button is and an instrument that's played a lot this is from the era probably of uh, smoking in venues and pubs where all this sort of tar deposits have sat on the valves and the reeds up by where the air button sucks in the dirty air. It also, I mean, it's re more recently it will have brought in dust, but, uh, you know, there definitely was smoking going on when I started <laughs> playing gigs. Uh, yeah. So I'll just make sure that slider is seated properly before I go and tighten this up. And the thing with sliders like this, if you tighten it up too much, you can actually end up putting too much pressure on this stop to operate nicely. So I always test that when I'm putting it back. Let's get the bases off. When you see an instrument with two stops on the left hand, um, what normally happens is that the base reads, these are the big base reads here, um, and there you can have a slider which would just take those in and out as well. 
that's not a difficult operation to retrofit either. Um, you just uh, have a, another stop here on the left hand side. Uh, so yeah, I mean I absolutely love the way these bases sound. There you go. There's, um, this is the proof that Niels Nielsen has done it because it's got the famous green wax that he used for a bit as a kind of, I don't know, calling card a little uh, without writing inside to say he'd done it. He'd know that he'd worked on this instrument before because of the green wax. Um, but no, I mean, really, the reeds are in amazing shape, really. It's the reeds themselves, not the way they're waxed in. You can see some of my incredibly messy waxing there on this one, which was done, uh, I think, after um, some reeds came out. Uh, the base reeds are often the ones to go if the instrument gets... Uh, gets joggled about a bit in transit um, you can you can actually get a bass reed coming free and I think that happened to me years and years ago and this uh, was re-waxed in by me at the venue <laughs> hence why it looks uh, like it's been done with a hot screwdriver but uh, it doesn't really affect how it sounds Pop him back in. So there we are inside the uh, the um, base end re block, and we'll uh, we'll actually go to the other side of the base end for this one uh, because this is the side which has taken a lot of damage just through constant playing. With this thing called a rotello, which is a, a way of changing the the height of the base end strap. There's a little, on this wheel there's a little threaded bit in the middle and that just moves up and down this rod. Uh, the base strap is not in lovely condition but uh, it still works. And then um, it's held in place with, well three of the four screws are still there. Uh, they're, uh, they're probably not original. Um, and uh, so we'll get them out. So that's a flat head. <laughs> and that's a flat head. And uh, here's a little piece I made uh, out of polymorph plastic to account for the fact that this hole has completely snapped off around it so this screw can still do its job of holding it into place. So here's the poor old back plate. It's uh yeah it's it's not in great condition. The air button itself um is just on this piece of metal at the back screwed on. Uh, this is how my microphones are bolted onto the ba the base end side. Please excuse the rainstorm in the background. Um, anyway, uh, we're going to go inside this uh, this left hand now. Um, originally, these pieces of uh, plastic holding the two parts together weren't there. That was done for me by Theo Gibb, and uh, um, the original. Uh, hook arrangement where the, the base buttons were attached to their um, pallets inside sprung from the bottom here uh, that wore down and wore away and we didn't have any uh, other way of doing it than to, to this neat little fix to allow this point where the two pieces of metal meet they're not the same pieces of metal there and there but the rubber tubing perfectly fits round and uh, does the job. These little pieces of rubber that go around these bits have a tendency to work their way off and that can lead to base notes slipping uh, and sticking which is not ideal. There we go. So, uh, and this base 
side thing can just come off the base strap it's just hooked on here so I'll go ahead and reassemble the whole instrument So here we are, all back together again, ready to go and play a tune on, and uh, that rainstorm's gone. <laughs> that was quick. <laughs> so uh, yes, this is uh, my my main box, and um, I'll, I'll play you a tune on it. I'll, I'll show you a few things that um, I, I'm quite that, that have drawn me to it. First is the the lovely sound of the right hand. <laughs> Um, and even things that I do quite often only really work on this box, like playing very high fifths to give a sort of spooky little tone behind numbers. Uh, it just has a really nice sound to it, and then it's got these incredibly thunderous responsive bass reeds, which um, my other Soul Trail doesn't really have, and a lot of my boxes don't have. They're just naturally very bassy, and uh, uh, you've seen them, they're, they're no different to other bass reeds. Um, uh, so yeah, it's... Um, Bit of a mystery as to why it sounds like it does, but uh, that means uh, I'm not going to be trying to upgrade it anytime soon because every time I try and get a box that's better than this, I always end up back playing this one again. I'll play something Christmassy, which we can all uh, get into because it's nearly Christmas, of course. Uh, I was getting all box nerdy again and forgetting this is also a Christmas thing, so uh, join in if you know it. Happy Christmas everyone, thank you for watching the advent calendar and uh, yeah, I'll see you next year some, somewhere. Bye for now.